Hi, this is Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and today is Wednesday, May 23rd, 2012. And what I'd like to do is an overview of the S&P 500 tracking ETF, the uh, SPY. And I'll be starting with a monthly chart, start out with the longer term charts, and work my way down to the intraday charts. So let's go ahead and start here. We're looking at a monthly view of the SPY, and I'm going to go ahead and start analyzing the price action. Now, what you see here, I have a lot of different trend lines drawn, and I've color-coded these trend lines. Uh, let's start with this blue uptrend line, and keep in mind this one goes back all the way to 1988, and it shows a pretty well-defined uptrend, uh, which uh, is pretty much a secular bull market. And that secular bull market was one of the strongest we've had in history, and uh, if this is one of the trend lines, or at least the one that I'm going by, that define that, that uh, secular bull market. Uh, one could say it ended here. Other people, and I can see the point in that argument, might say that secular bull market ended back in 2000, um, and that may be the case as well. Uh, either way, semantics, the bottom line is the market did peak back in 2000, put in this double top, made another high back in late 2007, and has still failed to, to even come back to those levels again. So uh, from a technical perspective, we could be looking at one massive double top pot pattern. And the way double top patterns work is you, you look at the base and draw, really focus on this horizontal line here uh, that I'm drawing between these lows, around these lows. And of course, it's looking out quite a bit in the future. But if prices were to get back down towards the bottom of that range, uh, that would be an area you'd watch because if a double top pattern breaks out below that then the price objective is pretty much the distance from the bottom of the pattern all the way up to the top you would add that on to the breakout so very very ominous but for now let's focus more so on this uptrend line prices have broken under that back in 2008 and remain below that line uh, a few weeks back I had posted this uh, same monthly chart here and I had mentioned putting in this this uh, downtrend line that connects these lows from 2009 and a couple of these uh, candlestick lows back around 2002. And I made a parallel line. I created a parallel line, put it up here. At that time, prices were right up at that level. And I mentioned that as a level to watch for a possible reaction for the market to turn down from there, which it has. And the fact that we've had this pretty impulsive candlestick, this long red candlestick, further helps validate this potential channel that I'm now watching. Um, you know, the fact that we turned down alone, but uh, add to that that it, we've had some impulsive selling off there. So again, something to watch. These white trend lines, these are sub uptrend lines, I call these. These actual, this one, for example, defines the cyclical bull market back from 2002 all the way up to 2007 uh, when that line was broken right around the end of the year uh, end of 07 early 08 uh, here's another one of those uptrend lines and we can draw this one I've had on my chart for a while off the 2009 lows the March 09 lows here that trend line was broken back in uh, July of last year price of prices fell pretty pretty uh, pretty impulsively down. It pushed back up to make a new high, uh, but that uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more on the weekly chart, uh, the new highs that we made here. And what I wanted to point out, I'm going to go ahead and bring up some of the indicators down below. Okay, first we're looking at the MACD, and as you can see with this orange line that I have highlighted here, uh, as the SPY put in a higher high, uh, we have a lower low on the MACD as well as a MACD histogram. Let, let's zoom in a little bit here. There's the regular MACD. This is these horizontal bar or vertical bars are the uh, MACD histogram, which we also have negative divergence in place on. Let's take a look at the rate of change 12, the ROC 12. Uh, in that last uh, chart that I put up, uh, it was actually the SPX, I believe, that I was put up a monthly chart on. Uh, and we're looking at the SPX tracking ETF here. 
And I had mentioned how this rate of change 12 has done just a, a, a really bang up job in the past of defining major uh, uptrends and downtrends, you know, primary uh, trends, bull markets and bear markets. And as you can see, there were a couple of false signals back here. Well, this one actually wasn't a false signal. There was a uh, quite a quite a, a correction there. And if you pay attention to the, the to the horizontal line, I'm sorry, the vertical line as I'm as I'm holding it here, and that'll show you where the ROC went negative. The the red bars are readings below zero. And if you look up here, that would have got you out of your longs towards the top and kept you short all the way until not not long after the lows back in uh, 2003. Uh, again, these aren't exact timing indicators. You're looking at monthly charts here. And what these are good for is helping you determine the primary trend, the main overall trend. That helps you formulate a bias or bullish or, or bearish bias. Uh, when reading the charts. So uh, the ROC 12 went positive here, kept you in the entire bull market all the way up until uh, you know, about the time of that trend line break right here in you know, the end of uh, 2007 and then signaled a new bear market and kept you there. Of course it didn't get you out at the bottom but uh, uh, once we hit, uh, looks about October, the month of October, the readings went positive and there was still plenty of upside left on the market from that point. So again, something to watch and here we are today. Let's zoom in a little bit more. I, I should point out we had negative divergence on the on the most recent highs on the S&P, negative divergence on that uh, ROC 12. and. When I pointed this out, there were a couple whipsaws recently that I mentioned. Very low readings. This one was a reading of negative uh, 0.39 for the month of uh, September, and we had a negative 0.25, so less than a quarter point in the negative. So what I'd be looking for here, we still have uh, another week or so left in this month, and right now the current reading is at negative 2.63. So if we close at or below that negative 2.63 level where we're currently at now, uh, I would say that's a pretty good early indication that we may be looking at a uh, primary uh, trend change, in other words, a new bear market. So something to monitor. Okay, moving on, let's take a look at the RSI. This is the RSI 14. And again, all, what, what, what we're showing here is negative divergence in place. Let's zoom that out a little. Looking at the orange line here on the SPY versus the uh, lower low in the RSI 14. Again, this was the monthly chart. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the weekly. Okay, here's the weekly chart of the SPY, and I see I'm already eight minutes into this video, so I'm going to talk quick here and try to breeze through this. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, shoot me an email. Uh, I did update these Fibonacci time zones, and I, I've been using these for, for about the last six to eight months. I just find them more than coincidental how, how these will line up with major inflection points in the market. And as you can see here, I placed the beginning at the peak of the market in 2007 at the highs and the next line if you look here this is where I drag from left to right I, I, all you can do is really set the first and second line the rest will auto populate and I did this at the um, peak on the uh, what the Elliott waivers would call the wave two up we had the five waves down in that primary uh, bear market wave one down wave two up the all-powerful wave three down, wave four up, which as you can see this Fibonacci time zone lines up perfectly, just about perfectly with the top of that wave four up and then the uh, final wave five down. And of course uh, continues on if you look at this major, major sell-off that we had back here in, uh, that was in late, uh, or May, May, May 2nd was a high in the market back then, May 2nd of 2010 if I remember right. Uh, somewhere around there. Uh, mark that. And again, if you look at the uh, recent highs in the S&P, coincidental or not, uh, that's where these numbers line up. Okay, uh, another thing to take note on here is this downtrend line. This was the, the 
key primary downtrend line on the S&P from their highs, the highs the market put in back in 07. And we had um, recently we broke out of those highs, which in itself is very bullish. Markets came up. I remember they struggled here a little bit. And then we punched through, made a new high, which in itself is bullish. However, if you'll note here, when we came back down during this correction, uh, it would have been a lot more bullish to see a retest of that level and that, that support level hold and prices to move back off there, especially move back off there impulsively. Not only did we not see that support level hold, we've gone under there and now we've, uh, we're have we retesting it from below. Prices are right about at that line right now and um, broken support now becomes resistance. So this is a level to watch and um, in my opinion by the near fact, mere fact that that level did not hold on a back test uh, puts another notch in the uh, bearish uh, longer term overview in my opinion. Okay. Uh, and on those lines before I move on if you look at put this uh, on these crosshairs focus on the horizontal line that I have. Uh, these were the previous highs in the market. Again, this was another area level right here that the market had had, had, pa had paused at for a little bit, excuse me, and then punched through. And if you can see here, I'll have to zoom in a bit. Let's do that. You can see once those highs were taken out, look at this very impulsive candlestick. That just shows that traders watch new highs and new highs are considered very bullish. So the market made this multi-year or at least a you know, high that it had taken out from the previous year. It punched through that in itself is bullish action. Uh, but if you look at what happened since, those highs didn't hold and we're well below those highs. So again, another uh, potentially bearish sign that the market could not hold the new highs that had taken out horizontally or this downtrend line. Both of those have failed. And now let's take a look down below at some of the uh, oscillators and indicators here. Here's the MACD. We'll zoom in a little bit. And if you focus on this line that I have highlighted here, the market had put in a higher high against uh, the MACD putting in a, a, a lower high, which is negative divergence. Um, let's take a look here at the RSI 14. And pretty much the same story there, as you can see from this point. Sorry, folks, it's, tried, it's hard when you try to squeeze everything into what these screen capture software allows. I can't, uh, I have to shrink my charts down quite a bit to get everything on there. But you can see clear negative divergence as well on the RSI and, and pretty much most of the uh, indicators and oscillators across the board. And again, we're looking at a weekly frame here. Now, what that tells me, the fact that we did put in that divergent high, it's, it tells me that we're probably not looking at a, just a usual, normal, run-of-the-mill, you know, 5%, 8% buy-the-dip type correction, um, that it probably is going to be a more lasting top, regardless of what the market does here in the short term. Uh, I'm not expecting the market to go on to make new highs any t anytime soon, especially after putting in such divergences at the high here on both the weekly chart that we're looking at as well as the monthly chart. Okay, zooming into the daily chart. Now we're looking at the daily time frame. And uh, again, let's start with price action and let's look at these FIBs. These are not the same FIB time zones that I just showed you on the weekly chart. These uh, I had adjusted uh, just tonight, uh, playing around with these. These are the daily, uh, this is a daily chart starting on the uh, May 2nd, 2011 highs. Remember last time I had uh, started those on the 2007 highs and uh, pretty much amazed at how well it, it uh, these fibs line up with the ma with a lot of the major inflection points. They don't get them all, but uh, pretty much hits uh, these major turning points. Uh, well, take a look for yourself. I won't exp spend too much time on them, but you can see there. Uh, you know, put those on your own chart to replicate. I don't know how well you can see in this video, but uh, this one called pretty much the lows here. And uh, there was a Another massive sell-off down there. That line, there's a candlestick right about here. Uh, we had a big bounce after that, and pretty much from this point right here, where the market had bottomed, you know, that was the beginning of the rally that went all the way up into, um, you know, well into March or April here. Uh, so uh, just take note. 
it, this line here was generated right on the recent highs just before this major sell-off. Maybe that's all we're going to see. Maybe it already called uh, this this, this turn here, this this big sell-off, uh, or this could prove to be a much bigger uh, turning point in the markets. That that'll all be yet to yet to be seen. Okay, uh, as far as prices go, we had this major uptrend channel I was tracking for a while. Uh, prices broke below that, and then I had this sub. I put a another parallel line to that channel, uh, which acted as another sub channel. Yeah, prices pushed back up, made a higher high after breaking down from this channel. Uh, but then once they broke this channel, so far that that was our you know on the site that's where where I entered most of the current sh swing shorts uh, when the QQQs and spies broke these levels on the daily charts, uh, daily four-hour and sixty-minute charts. And for the most part, I've held a pretty strong short bias since then. Markets pushed back up. Failed to make a new high, sold off pretty impulsively. This is the support level that I pointed out. I think it was on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. I had taken some some hedges, some SSO, which I have since sold. Uh, and since that point, we've just uh, we've actually held held that level a couple times, come come close to retesting it. it doesn't surprise me, uh, you know, to see such a major uh, support line. You have this reaction here, a couple couple candlestick touches here back here I mean this line goes all the way back through here I can I can see clear support there um, so I, I do expect or did expect a reaction which so far we've had uh, whether that line holds and proves to be the bottom of this pullback that's yet to be seen but uh, as of now I'm thinking uh, that regardless of any bounce we have even if it comes all the way back up here to this which is now a resistance line, one of my former support lines, I can easily see that happening and prices turning back down, possibly breaking this again, maybe just coming back to retest it. But uh, from what I'm looking at, I don't think that the bottom has been put in yet, uh, if not in price, at least not in time. Okay, let's pull up the MACD down below. You know, I'm a big divergence guy. The, we had the divergences back in on the October lows, very strong divergences. If you look at this downtrend line off the um, this low to the October um, October lows back on October 4th, we had very strong positive divert, positive divergence. Excuse me, and of course that led to to this ensuing rally. And since then, if you look at, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to draw that line. I didn't have it on this chart. I try to keep these charts as clean as possible, uh, but they usually do tend to get cluttered up quite a bit. Okay, the line I just drew here from this point, this high, this reaction high to the, to the so far, the highs for the year in the market uh, have pretty clear negative divergence in place there on the uh, MACD. And one other to look at here is the check and money flow, which uh, when the money flows go negative as they have recently, you typically you don't want to be in the market. Let's just again follow the vertical line up. Um, when you see check and money flow go negative, you usually see some selling. Uh, this wasn't the best sell signal. It did get you out here, at least warned you. you know, this market was very choppy and difficult to trade back here. Uh, we had money flows go negative back here, you know, a little bit before the top, which was a warning sign. And of course, if you look here, I've drawn divergences uh, that were put in the high. Moving on to the four-hour chart, I posted this late last week, I believe on Friday, as a uh, uh, a nice area, a possible shorting uh, area to short this resistance zone where I expected the markets to turn down, which they did. We had a pretty sharp reaction. Since then, prices fell pretty hard, and of course today we had a you know a nice ramp into the close, but we're still well below this resistance level. And if we uh, manage to get through there, of course we have this level overhead uh, as well. We have a lot of overhead supply to contend with. So uh, if if this is just if this move down proves just to be a correction, which is over, we still have a little bit of tough sledding on the upside. I don't think it's going to be a straight shot up for the bulls. Uh, you know, that's yet to be seen. And finally, the 60-minute chart. Uh, you know, I pointed out these channels the other day. We had this bull trap, this false breakout, and the very, very violent or impulsive selling 
after that breakout failed along with those bullish pennants that were formed on the uh, three minute charts. Uh, of course we've now moved back through the channel. At this point we've had a, f a fake out here. We had a candlestick spike through there. Uh, didn't surprise me that that failed because I had this this line on the charts for months here. Uh, we, it was just a, a key support line, you know, possible um, neckline on a head and shoulders pattern on the 60 minute chart that was tested from underneath. So that was a no brainer not to go long on, on, on the breakout down over here. But yet we've had one, oops, sorry, one, two, three. And at this point, I don't put a lot of credence into this channel. I'll probably go ahead and remove that. Uh, once you have a channel traded in and out of so many times like that, it just takes away from the, uh, the validity of that trend line, in my opinion. Um, but one of the overriding things here, keeping me keeping me on the bearish side and thinking that the markets have not yet put in the bottom, is we still do not have any type of divergence, positive divergences whatsoever on any time frame shorter than I think uh, I know there's 15 minute had some recent pos positive divergence so maybe the 30 minute I didn't look at a 30 minute time frame but uh, other than that uh, on, on major sell-offs and, and, and major rallies as well or trends intermediate term trends I like to see positive divergence put in place at the top or bottom it's not an absolute necessity but more often than not than not until we we get that divergence put in um, it may be premature here to go long and, and think that a bottom has been put in. Again, as I said a minute ago, uh, we don't necessarily have to go lower in price, although I think that uh, there's a good chance we do. But we could flounder around, we could move up for a while and then come back to retest this level uh, in price somewhere over here, you know, in the, in the near, near future, allowing the MACD to come in and put in a higher high uh, even if prices just came back down, we'd, that'd still be considered positive divergence uh, if prices retested this level or ideally pierced slightly below. So that's pretty much my thoughts, folks. And uh, we're now 22 minutes into this video. My goal one day is to keep these things under 10 minutes, but uh, sorry, I couldn't do it tonight. Have a great day.